Okay, we're continuing on talking about chronic obstructive pulmonary disorders. Now, we already said that COPD, or chronic obstructive pulmonary disorders, is an umbrella term, and it's pretty general diagnosis um, until we figure out what exactly the underlying diagnosis is to be causing that chronic obstructive pulmonary disorder. Um, so chronic bronchitis is one that falls under that umbrella, um, and it is talking about extended inflammation of the bronchi, and that includes a chronic cough, excessive mucus that usually was going to last for more than three months um, for at least two consecutive years. So this is very different from acute bronchitis that we talked about earlier where you have that, you know, it's a pretty acute infection, it's self-limiting, usually you get over it. Chronic bronchitis is where it lasts for a long time um, and then you're going to have that infection for two consecutive years lasting a few months at a time. Um, that's very important to remember. So. This chronic bronchitis typically develops gradually and it might go untreated for many years because you might just think, oh, I get bronchitis every now and then, oh, whatever. And you haven't really paid attention to how long the infection lasted and how frequently you're getting it. Um, it's characterized by hypersecretion of mucus um, and then recurrent and chronic respiratory tract infections. The cilia no longer moves secretions, so those little hairs that are inside of your bronchi that are supposed to move the secretions up help you get it out the cilia kind of die off and they're no longer moving secretions. So they really start to um, congest your lungs um, in a really severe way. The secretions stay in your lungs and you can eventually develop plugs where bacteria can then grow all around them and you develop systemic infections and really broad infections within your lungs as well. The signs and symptoms with early disease, you're gonna just notice a chronic cough at first. Typically you're gonna notice some thick white sputum early in the morning that might go away throughout the day, but every morning you might start noticing that thick white sputum every day. That's one of your first signs um, that it might be a chronic bronchitis infection. Um, frequent respiratory infections that last during the winter months, um, they usually can last several weeks up to a few months at a time in the early stages. In later stages, you're going to start seeing some yellow, purulent, really copious, sometimes blood streaked sputum. Now, typically, they're going to start doing tests for like tuberculosis and things like that once they start noticing sputum that looks like this. But it could just be a sign or symptom of chronic bronchitis. Um, you might start noticing some cyanosis, cyanosis, especially when they've been coughing for quite a while. Um, dyspnea often begins with exertion and then even occurs at rest. Um, you also might start noticing some right sided heart failure. And those signs and symptoms, if you remember, um, you'll notice tachycardia, hypoxemia, and po possibly some jugular vein distension as well, and probably some generalized swelling within the body. To diagnose it, we're going to look at the history of their signs and symptoms and see if they've had respiratory infections lasting more than three months for two consecutive years. A chest x-ray is also going to show some fluid accumulation, fluid overload within the lungs, some consolidation within the alveoli, and heart enlargement as well. Um, pul pulmonary function tests are going to show a decreased vital capacity of the lungs, um, but we really want to rule out cancer at these stages because we want to make sure that these things aren't representative of cancer or even tuberculosis. Um, to treat it, we want to teach the patient to stop smoking. I know you're shocked to hear me say that because I've never said that before, but um, it's very important because the smoking can um, decrease your body's ability to um, take up the oxygen that it needs. Um, we also want to give them some bronchodilators just to allow their respiratory efforts to be as effective as possible. Um, and we want to encourage a well-balanced diet. Um, adequate fluids are also key to help thin out secretions and um, keep your hydration status good. Um, postural drainage can also be very effective. And if you remember this, the different um, positions you can put the patient in. And typically we leave them there for 10 to 15 minutes at a time. Um, and then steroids can help suppress the inflammatory response as well. Here is your mnemonic device for chronic bronchitis, and we call him the blue bloater because he starts turning blue because um, he's not getting the oxygenation that he needs, and he's really, really bloated because of all of the extra um, fluid that is um, backing up into the body because of um, the inability for it to pass through the lungs and be filtered out and everything. Um, so that's just a little helpful little guy, your blue bloater. All right, let's go ahead and talk about emphysema. Emphysema also falls under that umbrella of COPD, and it is a chronic disease as well. Emphysema is really a tough one to, um, to watch people go through because it's very frustrating and, um, and there's really no cure for it. Um, so what you're gonna notice is abnormal distension of the alveoli. 
here is a picture right here. The alveolar walls will rupture, but they form together into these um, large sacs. And um, once they start forming together like that, that's eventually going to be called blebs. So typically, alveoli are their own little you know, circular structures, kind of like clusters of grapes. But when those walls kind of bleed together and they form these large sacs like blebs, um, they're not as effective as they were as tiny little sacs because the capillaries rupture, they're not um, contributing to the gas exchange, and a large sac, um, if you think about like tiny little balloons, how fast they blow up and how fast they deflate, versus one of those really big balloons, it takes a long time to even notice that there's any air in there at all, right? So the amount of air that goes in, is just, it's not as effective for gas exchange at all. Um, scar tissue is going to replace the damaged tissue, which then also decreases the gas exchange because that tissue is a lot thicker. Um, usually, the damage is per permanent by the time it's even diagnosed. Um, and so that's why it's really frustrating because a lot of times we don't even know that the patient is going through this until it's permanent and irreversible. As the de disease progresses, um, those blebs um, might cover the entire surface of the lung. The bloods can rupture and leak air into the thorax, and then they will develop a pneumothorax, which we will discuss later on. Um, but a pneumothorax usually doesn't occur except in like, major trauma. Um, a thoracentesis is then needed to remove air. Now, up to this point, whenever we've looked at, looked at thoracentesis, um, we've been removing fluid. But at this point, if those bloods rupture and they're leaking out air, we might need to do the thoracentesis to help release that air as well. Um, a chest tube is then put in place just to help prevent additional air from entering um, that pleural space and collapsing the lung even further. Here's a picture. Our whole goal with the chest tube is to allow for lung re-expansion. Okay? Um, that air that is in there is collapsing the lung even farther. If we put the chest tube in and we remove that air, the lung is then allowed to re-expand. Signs and symptoms of ex uh, emphysema, you're going to notice some exertional dyspnea, um, and then as the disease progresses, you're going to notice some shortness of breath, even as they're at rest. Um, it's a chronic productive cough um, that you're going to notice as well. They might start developing a barrel-shaped chest, and that's um, because they are constantly <gasps> breathing in, and it's just really hard for them to catch their breath and get the oxygen that they need. Um, we are going to notice some use of accessory muscles when breathing as well, um, prolonged expiration with wheezing, uh, and they're only able to speak in short, jerky sentences because of the inability to really pass the air between, um, not between, but into their lungs and out. Um, they often lean forward to try to catch their breath just to allow for some kind of lung re-expansion. Here's a picture of the barrel chest here. See how he's normal chested and then barrel chested. Um, as the disease advances, you're going to start noticing some memory loss, drowsiness, confusion, and loss of judgment. All of that is a result of just low oxygen status um, and then a high carbon dioxide status as well. If it's untreated, it can eventually lead to toxic levels of carbon dioxide in the blood, um, and then they develop CO2 narcosis, and that eventually could lead to their demise. Um, you are going to notice some diminished lung sounds because of their inability to expand in their lungs. Um, wheezing and crackles are also going to be noted because of the increased amount of secretions. And diminished or muffled heart sounds um, just because of the amount of air that gets trapped in the lungs and that diminishes um, what you can hear through to the heart and the lung. We want to teach them pursed lip breathing and that's where they... It actually makes their respirations a lot more effective. Um, and you are going to notice some accessory muscle, um, accessory muscle usage whenever they um, are breathing as well. To diagnose it, we want to get a chest x-ray and a CT scan, and that's going to show some hyperinflated lung fields. Pulmonary function tests are going to show um, just a decrease in the overall function of the lungs, and then ABGs are going to show hypoxemia and respiratory acidosis because of the increased levels of CO2. To treat it, our whole goal is just to improve their quality of life. We can't treat the disease, we can't cure it, um, and so we just want to slow the progression, clear any obstructions, and just increase the quality of life as much as we can. And we want to give some mucolytics to liquefy the mucus, um, give some supplemental oxygen just to increase their O2, um, give them some corticosteroids to suppress the inflammatory process, um, teach them deep breathing, coughing, um, chest physiotherapy, and postural drainage. 
as a nurse, we really want to monitor their O2 and CO2 levels. Now, there, I know that I said on the previous slide that we want to get supplemental oxygen, but there is this um, principle with emphysema, and it's only with emphysema, that states if you over-oxygenize a patient with COPD, specifically emphysema, it decreases their drive to breathe. Um, they don't end up releasing the CO2 that they normally would, and they end up becoming hypercapnic. Hypercapnic is a word that we use to describe increased levels of CO2. Um, however, they are receiving oxygen without increasing their respiratory rate. Eventually, in theory, they will stop breathing. Okay, and so that's something that's really frightening. Usually these patients, um, you'll have to limit their um, supplemental O2 just to prevent that phenomenon from occurring. So we always wanna assess each patient individually and see if um, they're able to um, breathe in oxygen on their own or if that supplemental O2 is actually decreasing their brain's ability to tell their bodies to breathe. Now this is high level stuff. You're not gonna be expected to understand this concept, but if you'd like to research it further, please go ahead and do that because it is something that will um, affect patients if you're gonna be taking care of somebody with emphysema. You wanna teach the patient diaphragmatic breathing, and that's where you put one hand on your abdomen and one on your chest, okay? And I don't know if you can see me, I'll back up so you can. So one hand on your abdomen, one on your chest. As they take in a deep breath, they should experience the abdomen rising and falling. <sighs> like that. So we also wanna teach them the pursed lip breathing, and that's, um, we can also call it pencil breathing, and it's where they purse their lips together like they're gonna be blowing a kiss and that helps them to actually have more effective breaths. It reduces their anxiety, reduces their dyspnea, um, and it's, it's actually very effective. Now I want you to look at the nutritional information that's in your book on page 281. You will be tested over that, so please make sure that you're familiar with the nutritional data that's on those pages and the recommendations that we've got there for the emphysema patients. Here's your mnemonic device for a patient with emphysema, and we call him a pink pepper. And with chronic bronchitis, we call him a blue bloater. With um, pulmonary emphysema, we call him a pink puffer. The reason we call them pink is because if you remember on the um, acid-base scale, at the acidic um, numbers are actually always displayed in pink. And so since he is acidotic, we are calling him a pink puffer. So pink, because he's acidotic, and <sighs> he's puffing, right? Okay, so make sure that you look at this and understand what it's talking about and review um, all the um, details with emphysema. Here's your question, go ahead and pause. Okay, now here are the answers. Check yourself and make sure you understand why those are the correct answers. Um, and if you don't understand, then you can ask questions, uh, ask a neighbor or just read up. All right, I'll be back.